Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. 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 Particularly Abby Walsh over there. Very nice of you to support her. So uh, directly across the street is the Westwood Masonic Building. Um, after this talk, you're all welcome to come over and, and see what a lodge looks like inside, see what Joseph Warren uh, you know, experienced as a Freemason. Lodge rooms have not changed much, and ours is particularly nice. Um, we take pride in it. It's a, it's a really nice visit. And um, at about 4.15, Christian will be over there to uh, sell some books and sign them for you if you want to get a personal uh, signed copy. So um, I encourage you all to take a look. Um, Freemasonry is the world's oldest and largest fraternity. It is comprised of adult men of 18 and over, of good character from every country, religion, race, age, income, education, and opinion. Its body of knowledge and system of ethics is based on the belief that each man has a responsibility to improve himself while being devoted to his family, his faith, his country, and his fraternity. Service, charity, and relief are explored throughout our degrees as essential ingredients of what it means to be a Mason. I'd like to just take an opportunity now to introduce another Freemason in Massachusetts, uh, Glenn Lawrence Kubik. Uh, Glenn was uh, elected Senior Grand Warden of our Grand Lodge in Boston in uh, 2022. And uh, he's going to give a, another brief talk about Freemason. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. As far as masonry is concerned, we are the world's oldest fraternity. We also do an awful lot of charitable work. However, we are first and foremost a fraternity that does charity, not a charity that does fraternity. And as far as our history, just in Massachusetts, our Grand Lodge is the third oldest Grand Lodge in the world. The oldest in not only North America, but almost the entire Western Hemisphere. So our Grand Lodge itself dates to 1733, so prior to the Revolutionary War. We've had very a, a great deal to do with the founding of our country as Masons. So when you talk about the founding of our country, you really can't talk about that without Masonry. And when you talk about that, you really can't talk about that without Massachusetts Masonry. There's a lot of names that we could throw out to you. Joseph Warren, one that some of you may not have ever heard about. But we also, in our ranks, we have George Washington, Paul Revere, William Dawes, Benjamin Franklin, and on and on. Some 14 U.S. presidents were Masons. And some of the events that we are involved in is the Boston Tea Party. Joseph Warren was a doctor. He actually treated some of the injured at the Boston Massacre. And he did and he did the autopsy on one of the, the, the young boy that was actually killed at the Boston Massacre. He wrote the Suffolk results. There's a lot of things that Masons have done early on in the founding of our country. And hopefully that will kind of sink in and that will have some sort of an impact with the group. Especially once we start hearing about Joseph Warren, and I don't want to steal any thunder, so I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he was killed. Um, he was killed outright. It was, who was he? Who did he treat? What was his name? Christopher Monk. But there was the one who lived for several years, and then that was Christopher Monk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question in the back? Yes. Yeah. Um, if, if you could repeat any questions that are asked 
so that they Thank get you. on the recording. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, we'll get right into the keynote speech. You've been traveling all the way from Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia. Uh, this man has dedicated decades of his life researching the life and importance of Dr. Joseph Warren. And without further ado, Christian Despicable. How many people have actually heard of Joseph Warren? And as soon as you leave Massachusetts, there's maybe one hand that goes up, which is really frustrating. So I'm glad to see a lot of people know. But what I'm going to do here is a deep dive today. I don't want to just do a George Washington slept here kind of talk. So you're really going to get nuts to, nuts to bolts. My publisher is going to be angry with me. <laughs> no reason to buy the book after, but I really want to give this crowd a deep dive into it, OK? But I want to start with the broad strokes, right? And I used to get challenged early on in my talk saying, hey, if this guy is so important as you say he is, why don't we know more about him? So I hope by the end of the talk, you'll agree with what I'm saying. If not, please challenge me. So what we're trying to do is get a documentary together. And we put a trailer together. It's, it's in Hollywood right now. We'll see if it gets picked up. But I'm going to show you a little uh, snippet. Imagine the founding fathers. Who do you think of? Usually people visualize George Washington. Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, Samuel Adams. So then the question is, why has no one heard about Dr. Joseph Warren? After years of studying about Dr. Joseph Warren, I began to ask myself, without his efforts, would there have been a declaration of independence or the American Revolution? Would we still be speaking with maybe a British accent? So Warren was not only the president of the Provincial Congress. He dispatches Paul Revere on his famous midnight ride. He was conducting an intricate spy network. He delivers two fiery Boston masquerations. The Battle of Bunker Hill becomes the bloodiest battle that produces the most casualty of any other battle throughout the American Revolution. Where are the founding fathers? They're at the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. It's Dr. Joseph Warren that shows up offers to fight as a volunteer and instead of retreating from the last seconds of the battle he makes sure he covers his men and he pays the ultimate price when a British musket ball hits him right in the face and he dies instantly upholding those twin notions of freedom and liberty that he had been fighting for. We're still continuing the Warren journey, and we need more people to join us to uncover that real legacy about who this man really was. We need to know about him now more than ever before. All right, now you only have to look at one of me, so be, be thankful. <laughs> now, all right, so let's... Look at this, right? So anytime we see any image, picture, photograph about the founding fathers, these are going to be the usual suspects, right? Samuel Adams, John Adams, George Washington, Franklin, Jefferson. You're never going to see Dr. Joseph Warren, okay? And I was asked to sum up the book in one sentence, okay? And really, before there was George Washington, there was Dr. Joseph Warren. And I will dig into this as we go a little bit further along. But let's hit the broad strokes, okay? We know that Warren is president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. This is the illegal government that the Sons of Liberty set up, okay? He's head of its committees of safety. He's grandmaster of ancient Scottish Rite Masons throughout North America. He authors the Suffolk Resolves. This is a pivotal document. It's a precursor document to the Declaration of Independence. He's at the head of a vast intelligence network conducting spying activities. He's appointed a major general a few days before the Battle of Bunker Hill. He's involved in every major battle and skirmish between Lexington and Concord in the Battle of Bunker Hill. He's writing polemical arguments, political tracts. He delivers two fiery Boston massacre orations. He's spearheading the committees of correspondence, which were essentially the first cell phones in the colonies, communicating information between the 13 colonies. He's heading the non-importation agreements. He's involved in every major insurrectionary event in the decade leading up to independence from the Stamp Act riots in 1765 to the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. And it's just a shame we don't know him, okay? Now, yes, sir? Who appointed him uh, the uh, general? 
it was the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. And I'll get into that a little bit later. So if you have any questions, keep them in mind, because I'm sure everybody will want to know those answers too. So really, in order to start at the beginning, I really need to kind of focus on the end, okay? This is 100 years after the, the Battle of Bunker Hill, the centennial anniversary. It's such an important moment in the nation because it's the first time since the beginning of the Civil War that northern and southern troops are marching in unison. So it's a healing moment in the nation. But 350,000 people descend on the city of Boston to celebrate and commemorate and honor Joseph Warren and his fallen comrades from 100 years earlier. Now, you know, I think one of the reasons the Civil War gets more attention than the Revolutionary War, we have the benefit of the Matthew Brady photographs. It just shows everything. So anytime I'm able to get some kind of photograph or picture, I get so excited because this was taken June 17, 1875, and you could see how many people are descending on the city. When I first started giving this talk, it was when the Red Sox had won the World Series, and I would joke around, there were more people here than the World <laughs> Series parade for the Red Sox. So. <laughs> but really, and I'm not going to dive into this too much, but you know, here's a sketch of his home from the mid-19th century. And one of the questions I had when I tore into this project was, you know, how does someone who comes from such humble beginnings, right? This is, again, Puritan Boston, highly stratified social society. How does he rise to become one of the top movers and shakers of all the colonies, not just the Bay Colony, okay? And there's a couple of reasons why. I'm not going to get into that. But the main reason is education, okay? He enters Harvard in 1755 as a freshman. At that time, class ranked is based upon the financial standing of the student's parents. So it would be like, I'll ask all of you, what's your bank accounts? And whoever's the wealthiest is going to be ranked number one. So just to give you an example, that year, the number one ranked student was the son of Connecticut Governor Jonathan Trumbull. Warren is at that bottom of the social barrier. He's like 35 out of 43 entering freshmen, okay? Now the amazing thing about it is, once you're ranked that low, unless new information comes to light, you're staying there. You're rooming with people who are lower ranked. The amazing thing about Warren is by his senior year, he's rooming with the top scholars. So it just shows you he's sort of elbowing his way out of this mediocrity. But when he enters Harvard, tragedy strikes the family, okay? His father was an apple farmer, harvesting Warren russet apples. The height of the apple harvest, October 1755, Joseph Warren's father falls from a ladder. Now, kills him instantly, okay? Now, I just want to show a quick sketch of Harvard, what it would have looked like at the time. Obviously, it doesn't look like that now. But you can see how a fall from up here would be lights out. And he falls, breaks his neck, dies instantly. Joseph Warren doesn't want to go back to school. He's the oldest of four sons. He immediately is pushed to patriarch of the family. His mother convinces him to go back to Harvard, and he does. Okay, and really, Harvard becomes his social oasis. This is where he's rubbing elbows with the future leaders of the colony. Names like the Olivers, the Hallowells, the Hutchinsons, okay? Now, what was amazing about this project is for about 150 years, everything printed about Warren claimed his direct descendants died out 150 years ago. I got lucky, I found descendants. They opened their homes to me, showed me all kinds of artifacts, family trees, this was actually taken at the sixth great-grandson's farm somewhere in Virginia. They don't want me to disclose where, but you can see what the Warren Russian trees look like. These, these apples still exist, and it was created by Warren's grandfather, this particular strain. Now, you're never going to see a photo like this, but this is one of the few images, pictures, paintings that we have of Joseph Warren as a Freemason, okay? This was painted in 1825 by Brother William Swain, okay? This actual painting is in Lincoln, Massachusetts at the Joseph Warren Solby Lodge, okay? But again, when he leaves Harvard, that becomes his social oasis, Freemasonry. This is where he meets men like Paul Revere, John Hancock, okay? Here's another image. We see Washington, Lafayette, Warren. So you wouldn't believe how much a part of the national conversation Warren was in the early days. And we'll cover that as well. But here's a close-up of that image, and you can see Warren right there. Now, history has told us that Warren's mentor was Samuel Adams, almost like Samuel Adams was the puppeteer, and Warren was the blank slate that he molded. It's nonsense, okay? When Warren enters this orbit of Whig radicalism, he's already heavily entrenched in his political philosophies. 
His first mentor was Dr. James Lloyd. Okay, so when Warren graduates Harvard in 1759, there's no medical schools in the colony. So how do you become a doctor? You either go over to the glittering capitals in Europe and you do your apprenticeship there under a physician, or if you don't have the money, you stay in the colonies and you do your apprenticeship under a physician who has done the apprenticeship over in Europe. And Warren chooses wisely. Dr. James Lloyd was over in Europe. He's learning the most up-to-date political um, medical techniques. Think about it. I mean, medicine at this point is basically barbaric, okay? So Warren is learning smallpox inoculations, obstetrical care, okay? Now, how does this son of a humble Roxbury farmer become a gentleman, right? Well, Lloyd is not only teaching him how to master the nuances of a bedside manner, he's teaching him how to become a gentleman, how to dress, how to entertain. Lloyd is politically connected, socially connected. He comes from a wealthy Anglican family. This is really Warren's first mentor. He's friends with men like General Howe, Lord Hugh Percy, okay? Lloyd is a loyalist, remains a loyalist throughout the entire American Revolution, okay? So again, we have to give Warren a little credit because his mentor was a loyalist. And I use this image just as an example to show you obstetrical care is handled mostly by midwives back then. But Warren and Lloyd are introducing obstetrical care into the town of Boston. Okay? Now, how does he rise to power? In 1764, there's a horrific smallpox outbreak in the town of Boston. Very similar to COVID. I mean, you would not believe the similarities between 1764 and 2020. Now, at this point, smallpox inoculations are not popular. Several decades earlier, there was a firebomb thrown through Cotton Mather's window because he was promoting smallpox inoculation. So at this point, smallpox is seen as God's divine intervention to punish the weak and sinners. But Warren inoculates over 100 patients, not one of them die under his care. This is important because this was a death sentence for the most part. The mortality rate back then was 33%. So there was a one in three chance that if you got smallpox, you were gone. If you survive, chances are you'd be horribly scarred, lose your eyesight, go blind, okay? So when Warren does this, once the smallpox breakout subsides, he becomes one of the heroes in Boston, him and the other doctors. This is where he first meets John Adams because he inoculates John Adams' brother. And this is the earliest description we have of Warren. He's only 23 years old. Now around this time, well, let me get to this, just to show you how nasty this was. This was front and center on everyone's mind, okay? This was a painting by Charles Wilson Peale, okay? He painted several paintings of George Washington. His infant daughter dies from smallpox, and he paints her and his wife. Here's another example. Boy on the left, not inoculated. Boy on the right is. This was from the early 20th century. So you can see how, how grisly this could be. And if you, weren't, if, if you caught it and survived, you had lifetime immunity, okay? So not one person dies under Warren's watch. The smallpox breakout subsides. He marries Elizabeth Hutton Warren, okay? We've been told he marries her for financial gain. Not true, okay? We also discovered that this painting was not painted by John Copley. It was painted by Henry Pelham. Why is this important? Well, we're correcting the historical record, but this is enlarging Warren's social circle because Henry Pelham is the original engraver of the Boston Massacre engraving that Paul Revere gets credit for. He's John Copley's half-brother. He's a loyalist. So you're starting to see that Warren has a foot on each side of the political divide, right? He's friends with loyalists and he's friends with patriots. You can see this in his medical ledgers that he's treating every rung of the social ladder from slaves to the royal government, okay? So why does he cast his lot with the loyalists? It doesn't make sense. It's basically financial suicide because Royal Governor Thomas Hutchinson appoints him as the almshouse physician for the town of Boston. He makes over a thousand pounds within a three-year period. He becomes the administrator to the wheelwright estate, which is a lucrative post, okay? And he's close with Hutchinson. Hutchinson settles his father's estate, okay? Hutchinson, Hutchinson appoints him to these positions. So again, Royal Governor Joseph Warren are friendly. And Warren goes to Harvard with his sons. And this is when he enters the orbit of Whig radicalism, right? He, John Hancock, Samuel Adams. These are the, the, this is the revolutionary odd couple we always hear about, but we never hear about Warren. And at this time, Samuel Adams is kind of regarded as this shabbily clad clothing, okay? He's not good with money. He's seen as a rabble rouser. 
Warren, on the other hand, is a generation younger. He's also Harvard educated, but he's a physician. He's a gentleman doctor. He loaned Samuel Adams money in about 1768 because Adams is not collecting the tax debt he's supposed to. So Warren comes to his rescue. Now, let me just underscore this, okay? This is Warren's medical ledger. It's in Massachusetts Historical Society. This is June 1768, okay? This is three years after the Stamp Act riots. This is when the, the Liberty Affairs happened with John Hancock's loop. So he's treating Samuel Adams. Look how he spells the last name. A-D-A-M-E-S, right? Maybe he spelled his mentor's name wrong. But here's the real smoking gun. He refers to him as the Speaker of the House of Representatives. But Adams was never the Speaker. He was the clerk. So we're not trying to detract from Samuel Adams. We're trying to point out that Warren has his own political philosophy at this point, okay? He's already a radical. And these men are more on an equal footing than we've been told, okay? This was amazing because two of Warren's medical ledgers have been lost. And I was fortunate enough to find this at auction and buy it, okay? This was in 1771. The years missing are 69 to 73. But it just shows this, which I thought was amazing. Christopher Monk, we just mentioned this name earlier with Glenn. Sixth victim of the Boston Massacre. He doesn't die until 1780. Warren's treating him gratis. Do we all remember that show, Little House on the Prairie? <laughs> I mean, I never watched this, but you guys did. <laughs> you remember the doctor? And he's yeah. treating patients, and how are they paying him? Chickens. This is amazing, because when you read the other side of the ledger, that's how Warren's getting paid. Flour, beer, shoes. He's canceling payments, saying in consideration of this family's misfortune. So he's gaining a reputation as this general, generous healer, okay? So this comes the rise to power. But again, let's underscore this. Jacob Royal, the Royal family was the biggest slaveholding family in the Bay Colony. So again, Warren is treating every rung of that social ladder, okay? This I found fascinating, okay? So we didn't know anything about Warren, right? He's a very obscure figure. We didn't know how he traveled, did he have a horse and carriage, but I found this document in the Boston Public Library, right? And it says, to painting a carriage vermilion. So what does that one sentence tell us, right? Well, we know he has a carriage, so if he has a carriage, he's got money. Vermilion, that's the single most expensive color in the colonies, and it's in high fashion in London. So just imagine if I pulled up here in a stretch Rolls Royce with a fountain in the back. I mean, this is what it would have looked like back then. Really wealth, ostentatious, okay? John Hancock also has a vermilion colored carriage, so we're also seeing this rise to economic prominence, okay? This, I'm going to gloss over this, but this is one of the few material culture pieces that exist. It's in the Scottish Rite Masonic Museum and Library in Lexington. They didn't know if this was Warren's clock. We actually proved it was with primary source documents. So this clock would have been in his office the night he dispatched his Revere and Dawes. And this is important because this is the single most expensive item someone could own at the time. Okay, this is an eight-day clock. Now, John Adams, right? We know now that they were much closer than previous realized because those descendants that opened their homes to me, they pull out this one day when I'm there. It's a silver porringer handle. This is usually given as a gift at a baptism or a christening. And you can see it says, the I is a J, but it's John Adams to Joseph Warren. And these men are very close. Warren actually keeps encouraging Adams to get more involved in the rebellion. Now we'll gloss over this because I don't want to get a history lesson here, but this is the event that sets off the Boston Massacre, the killing of Christopher Sider. People have called him the first martyr of the revolution. Warren performs this autopsy. This happens 10 days before the massacre. So let's jump to the massacre. This engraving was done by Henry Pelham, but Revere actually steals it, gets the credit for it, and there's actually a nasty letter back and forth between him and Revere, where he's accused of stealing it. But we know Warren's in town this day because he signs a court document, he's performing autopsies, he's treating the wounded. But this is where he really comes into the, into the fray. They need to put a pamphlet together. It's a propaganda pamphlet to get their version of events over to England, okay? Warren is one of three men appointed. They collect 100 depositions, okay? And they spin this event calling it the Boston Massacre. And most of the depositions collected are friends, patients, schoolmates of Warren. So you just see he's completely saturated in this town of Boston. 
This I found interesting because number one, I said he's been accused of marrying his wife for financial gain. Usually when someone died, if you were wealthy, you would order what was called a mourning ring from a goldsmith, okay? And usually that's what was on the facade. That's an actual mourning ring, okay? Not, that, not the one I found, but this is the picture I found in a newspaper after Warren's wife dies and he had this order. So you can see the ring, 16 precious stones, the urn. We had an artist do a modern day sketch of what that would have exactly looked like. Now why this is impressive is because you had to be wealthy to order a mourning ring. But if you order one with 16 precious stones, again, ostentatious wealth, okay? Now, sadly, his wife dies in the spring of 1773. He becomes a widower. He's left with four young children, okay? And the year before, they lost one of their daughters in infancy. And that's the big connection between him and Paul Revere, right? So Paul Revere and Joseph Warren's fathers both die when they're teenagers. They both lose children in infancy, and both their wives die within a week of each other, and they're both the Sonic brothers, okay? Now, here's the event that really kicks it off, right? The Boston Tea Party. It wasn't called that for 50 years. For the first 50 years, this was called the destruction of the tea. And what people don't realize, this event sets off at least 10 other tea parties up and down the northeastern seaboard, okay? There was actually one in Yorktown, Virginia. There's one in South Carolina. There's one in New York City. Okay, we see this with the jokes, retreating to the harbor because they only wanted liberty. Now, the point being, I'm not trying to push masonry here, right? I'm pushing facts. So the whole point is, is that this is a Masonic-centric event. I'm actually doing additional research on this looking at all the names of the Tea Party participants, you wouldn't believe how many were Masons, right? And Samuel Adams was not a Mason, okay? And I bring this up because this is important, okay? This is the Green Dragon Tavern. This is where the Masons met, okay? It's been called the headquarters of the American Revolution. Warren attends his Masonic meeting a week after his wife dies, so he throws himself back into the rebellion. But here's what's happening here. The Committees of Correspondence are meeting here, the Sons of Liberty, the North End Caucus, upstairs is where they're having the lodge meetings. On November 30th, what's written in the minutes is that the consignees of tea took up the brethren's time. All right, so here's what we need to define, right? When we say tea party participant, what do we mean? Do we mean someone's physically dumping chests off the Eleanor, the Beaver, the Dartmouth, or was someone behind the scenes planning? I don't know if you've heard, but the Tea Party Shipping Museum is planting markers in every Tea Party participant's gravesite. And they're being very liberal about it. So I think if you farted near the wharf in the month of December of 73, you're getting a marker. Uh, and they're putting, here's the amazing thing. This, they're not putting one for Warren until I mentioned it. What about Warren? His fingerprints are all over this event, OK? He's having meetings with the main movers and shakers of this event in the month leading up to this, OK? So this sketch. We've been told it was done right after the Tea Party, but it wasn't. It was done a few decades later because you can tell by the art. This dark part is more of a late 18th century, but you can see the Masonic symbolism, okay? And here's what it says on this. Where we met to plan the consignment of a few shiploads of tea, December 16th, 1773. There was a Masonic meeting here on the day of the Tea Party. They couldn't get a quorum, they break up, they moved to Old South Meeting House, Warren speaks there, but again, his fingerprints are all over this event. He is planning this entire thing. Because we know the tea consignees, right? The Hutchinsons, patients of his, friends of his, okay? Two owners of the, of the ships, Francis Roch, John Rowe. Well, John Rowe is a Masonic brother. Francis Roch is one of his patients, okay? What we also didn't know is that his wife's father, who was very wealthy, who he inherits from, he inherits half of something called Hutan's Wharf, which means he's completely connected to the seaside population. Ship captains, sailors, okay? So Warren is moving and shaking along the ports of Boston, okay? Again, his fingerprints are all over the event and he just gets no credit. This was actually conducted in secrecy, but again, we have proof that Warren was heavily involved in this event. Now, I mentioned his wife passed away. He begins to see another woman, his fiance, Mercy Scully. These are her parents, okay? Now, what happens after the Tea Party? Well, Britain decides they're gonna punish Massachusetts, so they pass the Intolerable Act, known as the Chorus of Acts. The first thing they did was shut down the Port of Boston, June 1st, 1774, which basically puts a stranglehold on Boston's economy, okay? There's an engraving by Paul Revere. 
So what does Warren do? He writes what we mentioned earlier, the Suffolk Resolves. Okay, this is basically a declaration of war. He's telling the colonists, we have to prepare militarily, okay? Get your arms and ammunitions ready. So it's a declaration of rights and grievances. So what did he do? This house still stands. It's been moved into Milton, Massachusetts now. But this is where he wrote the Suffolk Resolves, okay? Now, had Warren done nothing else, we owe him an enormous debt of gratitude because this is the precursor document to the Declaration of Independence. But what's happening at this time? Where are the founding fathers? They're in Philadelphia in September of 74. 56 assembled delegates, very acrimonious, okay? They're looking at Massachusetts as a problem colony that's causing them all these issues. What does Warren do? He dispatches Revere on one of his first rides to bring news of the Suffolk Resolves to the Continental Congress. And what happens? They all adopt it unanimously. So it turns from this bitter, acrimonious, hostile environment to one of more peaceful, okay? And if you think Northern-Southern rivalry was new to the Civil War, it was not, okay? It was alive and well during the colonial period. So again, when people say, well, the founders didn't know who Warren was, it's nonsense. They all knew who he was just from this document. Now, things are so bad, right? We have the benefit of hindsight. He doesn't know if he's going to get assassinated. His second Boston massacre ration in March of 75, British soldiers are threatening whoever delivers this is going to be assassinated. He volunteers to do it, sees five patients that morning, and delivers that oration. And because of these threats of assassination, he sends his family and his fiance out to Worcester, Massachusetts, under the care and protection of Dr. Elijah Dix, who's a friend of his. Are we all following? Am I losing anyone here? Yeah. All right, we're all on board still? Okay, well, here's where it gets a little juicy. Right? <laughs> so Paul Revere's ride. I mean, why do we call it that, right? I'm not detracting from Paul Revere, but it's Joseph Warren's intelligence information that leads him to dispatch Revere and Dawes. This sets off the shot heard around the world. Without Warren's intelligence, that's not happening. There is no Lexington and Concord. But what happens when Warren finds out that eight militiamen have been killed on Lexington Green? He doesn't go sit behind his desk and start penning letters to the Continental Congress. He rides out to Monotony, modern-day Arlington, where the worst fighting is happening, and he's almost killed when a musket ball knocks out his hairpin. Okay? So almost this aura of invincibility starts to envelop Warren, just like George Washington when they say his famous letter, there was something charming about the bullets whizzing by me. He's got bullet holes in his cape and in his tricorn hat. Okay? We know that he's got a high-level system of intelligence because Revere writes a letter saying that him and 30-plus fellow mechanics are monitoring British troop movements, giving that information to Dr. Joseph Warren. There's other letters that have come to light that I discovered. Okay, So we've all heard of George Washington's Secret Six, Nathan Hale. This is all before that, okay? This is a year, two years before all of this. So when Washington winds up in Cambridge after Warren's killed, this system's already set up. But yet we see Washington as his spy master. Again, we're not detracting from these other founders. We're trying to underscore Warren's importance here. And this legend only starts really in the 1860s with the Longfellow poem. When you look at all the primary source documents before this, there's no such thing as Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Is Joseph Warren's mission, okay? Now, Revere has been called the Mercury of the American Revolution, okay? But we're finally going to correct the historical record here, okay? <laughs> so history has told us for 250 years that Warren dispatches Revere and Dawes on their midnight ride from his doctor's office on Union Street. This is where the beginning of the revolution is set off. Not true. Warren left this property, moved to a completely different location, so this beginning of the American Revolution happens somewhere completely different than history has told us for two and a half centuries. This is the house they claim he sent Revere on the ride from. It's not. He left here in 71, and he moves to a different property called the Chardon Home, which was described as being at the head of Wings Lane near the flesh and fish markets. Okay? This is near Old Chardon Street in Boston. Okay, let's jump. Battle of Bunker Hill, okay? First pitched battle of the American Revolution, okay? June 17th, 1775. We've all seen this painting. 
It's on book covers, it's in museums, it's, it's everywhere, okay? The period between Lexington Concord and Bunker Hill we call the 60 days, okay? Because we're always in every battle and skirmish. Lexington Concord, uh, Grapes Island, Noddles Island, Bunker Hill, okay? So what happens is this day, the British soldiers make three assault charges to get up this hill. The first two they repelled. On the third, the Patriots run out of ammunition, okay? Warren stays until the last seconds of the battle so that his men can retreat. When he shows up at this battle, both General Israel Putnam, Colonel William Prescott, two grizzled French and Indian war veterans, much older than Warren, much more experienced, say, hey, we know you just got appointed as a major general. You take command of the battlefield. And he says, no, my commission hasn't been officialized yet. I am here as a volunteer. Tell me where the fighting's going to be the heaviest, the worst, and that's where I'm going. The problem I've had with all the historical books and records is that they depict Warren as showing up to this battle like a cheerleader. And instead of pom-poms, he shows up with a sword, two pistols, and a musket. And he is actually picking off the British officer corps. This battle produces the most casualties of any other battle throughout the American Revolution. The officer corps of the British Army is decimated. Okay, they suffer over a 50% casualty. This does not repeat itself throughout the American Revolution. Now, when people start to find out Warren was there, they question it and think, why, why was he at this battle? Why, it, was, it was so important. The thought of him fighting then is no different than a politician going to Iraq and Afghanistan today and fighting. It's almost inconceivable. Nobody believed that he was actually there. When Thomas Hutchinson finds out that Warren's been killed, his quote is, had Warren lived, he would have become the Cromwell of North America. Mm -hmm. Hutchinson's lieutenant governor, Peter Oliver, says, had Warren lived, George Washington would have been in obscurity. These are two of the most powerful British officials in Boston saying this about Warren. I'm not saying it. When they find out he's been killed, one of the major generals at the Battle of Bunker Hill says, Warren's death is worth 500 of my bravest soldiers, okay? They also quote as saying, Warren was the greatest incendiary in all America, not Samuel Adams, Joseph Warren, okay? Now here's what happens when he's killed. This is no prejudicial information against British soldiers, but think about the humiliating defeat they suffered at Lexington and Concord. That whole afternoon on June 17th, they're watching the officers getting picked off. It's basically Patriot target practice. When they scale the walls of that redoubt, they don't know the Patriots are out of ammunition. It turns into a bloodbath. They're in a blood rage. There's letters from the soldiers saying, when we mounted those walls, we took the breeches of our muskets, started beating in the heads of the wounded Patriots, and started stabbing the others with the muskets and their bayonets. Now, when they find out Warren's been killed, okay, they strip him of his clothing, they take all his personal possessions, which includes intelligence papers in the fold of his waistcoat, and they bury him in a shallow ditch. Now, so let's get, yes, do you have a question? Yes. Wasn't the Battle of Bunker Hill actually fought on Greensville? Let me get there. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there, I promise. But her question was, wasn't the Battle of Bunker Hill fought on Greensville? It's a great question, and you're absolutely right. It is a misnomer, but I'll cover that in a few more slides. But let's get back to why he's not remembered, right? So let's dig into that. So what happens this day? Who are the heroes in the colonies at this point? Well, there's no Superman, right? There's no movie stars. There's no pop stars. So who are the heroes? Well, it's British military or nobility. So the hero before Warren is British General James Wolfe, who's killed during the French and Indian War on the Plains of Abraham in 1759. So if you went into a colonist's house, odds are you're either going to see a print of British General James Wolfe or King George III. So Warren becomes the first American martyr. And if anyone remembers him today, it's like, oh, isn't he the guy who gets killed at Bunker Hill? Or, oh, he's the guy who sends Riviera on his midnight ride. If people remember him at all. So the shame is that this one afternoon completely overshadows 10 years of resistance activities, right? From the Stamp Act crisis, to the non-importation agreement, to the Committees of Correspondence, the Boston Massacre, the Tea Party, Lexington Concord, Suffolk Resolves, Bunker Hill. He's just remembered as this fighting general, okay? But here's the revolutionary paradox. Think of all the founding fathers, right? Do we think of them as these young strapping lads, or do most of them die 
in their beds, years removed from the revolution as old men. Warren is one of the few who dies days after his 34th birthday on the battlefield. I, I can't think of really anyone as integral as him who dies on the battlefield, right? And where are the founders again? They're in Philadelphia, the city town. So let's do the juxtaposition between Warren and Washington, right? And again, we're not detracting from Washington. Washington will become first president of the United States. He will become Washington. But this is not the miraculous victory in Yorktown, 1781. Let's not look at this from a 21st century mindset. Let's look at this from 1775. Who's Washington at this point? He's two decades removed from battle. He's been a retired colonel of the Virginia Regiment for almost 20 years. He hasn't been winning any successful battles. It's just been a series of mishaps during the French and Indian War, okay? When he shows up, right, we said Northern-Southern rivalry. Washington actually writes a letter saying, the New Englanders are a dirty, nasty rabble. So it's nice to see you guys have cleaned up over the centuries. Okay? But this is the point. So Washington arrives with these negative stereotypes, okay? And just to show you how well known he wasn't, his two soldiers that are writing in their diaries, a new general arrives today. A general named Washington arrives today. So he shows up about 10 days after Warren's killed, okay? He's got to fill Warren's shoes, right? How could a man like Washington, right? His bravery, his character, his ethics, his morals, his courage, how could he not admire what Warren just did? Right? They all know he's got four orphan children. They all know he's 34 years old. They all know he wasn't supposed to be at that battle. And now they know that he was recovering his, recovering his retreating men so they could escape to safety. I mean, just imagine the nerve that took to stand there as there's dozens of British soldiers charging you with Bayonets fixed. I mean, have you ever seen a West Point graduation with the glint of that steel? I mean, it is intimidating. And he's standing there with a sword and empty pistols. I mean, he gives his life, okay? And we forget that. But let's go here, right? We talked about the fighting general, right? But here's the push and pull. His entire adult life, worn as a healer, saving lives. But we remember him as this vicious, violent, fighting general, right? So let's look at all the depictions if you want to Google them. This is what comes up, right? All military uniforms. The generals, right? Warren, Montgomery, Wayne, Green. Military uniform. Musket in hand. That's him on the left with the musket. That's him on the right with the musket. Is a statue of Warren P.A. Sword. Roxbury Latin. Sword. Okay? Forest Hills. Sword. Bunker Hill Monument. He's got the sword on the left. Right there. So again, he's depicted as this martial general, but he was really a revolutionary healing physician. Okay? And to your point, how does America lose the Battle of Bunker Hill? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's even a misnomer, right? Wasn't even called Bunker Hill at the time. Bunker Hill was about 100 yards away. They're fighting on Breeze Hill, okay? So there's the monument in Charlestown. But here's the problem. This monument is to a lost battle. We didn't win this battle. We lost it. And who's front and center outside? That's not Joseph Warren. That's William Prescott. Okay? Joseph Warren is kind of buried in the monument. You have to go in to see him. And here starts the jokes in the political cartoons. Okay, this surfaces in 1776 in Britain. We all remember Bunker Hill Bunny. Okay, <laughs> they start poking fun at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Okay. Here's another cartoon, right? The British soldiers are mounting Reed's Hill, and here's the Patriots with a jar of beans that they're gonna throw at them because they're out of ammunition. And speaking of beans, there's even a Bunker Hill chili now, okay? And it gets worse. Battle reduced to jokes, right? What's the craziest battle of the American Revolution? The Battle of Bunker's Hill. And guess who else was at this battle? Frankenstein, okay? So Frankenstein fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill. I mean, it's just wacky stuff, okay? So this I want to bring up, this is a little off topic, but we usually hear the name Benedict Arnold and everyone hisses and boos, okay? I'm right there with you. But before he flips, Arnold shows up in Boston a couple of weeks after Lexington and Concord and goes to Warren because he's president of Provincial Congress. 
and says, hey, I have an idea. This cannon up at Fort Ticonderoga. If you give me a commission, arms, ammunition, and some money, I'll go up and try and get those cannon. Warren approves it, signs off. Arnold meets up with Ethan Allen. They capture these cannon at Fort Ticonderoga, and that's what breaks the siege of Boston eventually, okay? But here's the amazing thing. So, Warren's widow, Mercy Scully, she inherits care of the children. There's a nasty custody battle that ensues between Warren's relatives. But I found this letter, and here's the date, right up here, you see it? July 1780. So Arnold's treason is uncovered in September of 1780. So to this is attached a six-page letter from Warren's fiance thanking Arnold for all the help he gave. Well, what's this? 2,909 pounds. That's how much money Arnold gave voluntarily from his own pocket to Warren's children to help them. That's almost $600,000 in today's money. So it's pretty mind-blowing that a man accused of putting coin over the country donates $600,000 from his own pocket for Warren's office. Okay? This, this turned Arnold scholars on their head. It just, it's opened up a whole vortex here. Okay? So, and here's what happens, right? The one thing we can fault Warren for, for being at that balance, he never makes arrangements for the children. So it ensues that nasty custody battle between his Warren mother and his brothers. And when you read her letters, right, she remains Warren's unofficial widow for a half century, like Alexander Hamilton's wife, okay? She doesn't die for 50 years, and what's so heartbreaking is that when you read her letters in 1825, 1826, she's writing as if Warren died yesterday. She loses custody of the children, she never remarries, okay? She gets very sick later on. It's just, it's just a heartbreaking story. And what's so poignant is that they're both unearthed and reburied within six months of each other, 50 years after Bunker Hill. But I just want to prove that Warren is still very much a part of the conversation in the decades after the revolution, right? So here's a tribute, okay? Here's the first eight presidents. You see all the Masonic imagery. Here's George Washington. These soldiers represent one of the 13 colonies. Here's Lafayette, Bingo, Joseph Warren. This was in a misfile folder at the Library of Congress, okay? So again, you can see all the popularity that Warren has because prior to George Washington's death in 1799, there's more towns, counties named after Warren than Washington, okay? And this blew my mind. So this is a centennial ribbon from the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1875. So look who's on it. Washington, Lafayette, where's Warren? I mean, these, neither of these gentlemen were at the battle. So again, Warren just for some reason just keeps flying under the radar. So this is his nephew. What's impressive about this is that his family, there's a medical dynasty, nine generations of Harvard doctors. That's his nephew. He's one of the founders of Harvard Medical School, Mass General, New England Journal of Medicine, okay? This was amazing because Warren's one of the most migratory corpses of the founders. He's moved at least four times over an eight decade period. And in 1856, when they unearth him again, they take daguerreotype images of his skull, okay? And we can clearly see the bullet hole that hits him right there and exits there. So all these 19th century accounts where he's giving these motivational speeches on the battlefield, I mean, his face was basically blown off. It's, it's not true, okay? And one of the other problems is he's not buried along the Freedom Trail. Nobody wants to go out to Jamaica Plains, okay? And uh, Glenn, along with two other gentlemen, put that brain trust together and got that statue at Forest Hills in October 2016. Think about the first seven presidents. The one who had a surviving son, that son becomes president, right? John Quincy Adams. So very much in a, still a patriarchal state here, okay? Primogeniture. Both Warren's sons die in their early 20s with no children. He only has one surviving daughter, okay? And because of her, she has one son from a second marriage, and that's where the current descendants all trace the lineage. His youngest daughter dies in Greenfield, Massachusetts, right around the time Mercy Scully. We're nearing the end here, folks. But this was so amazing to me. So when I met the descendants, I didn't realize there was a military dynasty, right? This is Warren's fifth great grandson. He was Green Beret Special Forces in Vietnam. He dies due to complications of Agent Orange cancer. There's been a Warren descendant who participated in every major American conflict from the Civil War 
to the present day, nine West Point graduates, six commissioned officers, five non-commissioned military <coughs> officers, just, just really impressive. So you have that medical and that military dynasty. Okay. He puts, there's a statue of him in Roxbury, Massachusetts, but it's literally in the shadows, right? This is taken down, now it sits at Roxbury Latin School, his alma mater before Harvard. We all know the book John Adams, we've heard of this, most of us, right? Let me just give you an example, okay? So, let's say John Adams, let's say we kill him off right after he signs the Declaration of Independence, right? So he would have been six years older than Warren, he would have signed the Declaration of Independence, McCullough's book won't even finish chapter two. So this is my point. If you strung together all the letters between John and Abigail, I think it would stretch about 10 miles. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's hardly anything on Warren. That's why you don't see a thousand biographies on him like Washington, because you really have to dig and cross your fingers and hope. Do we remember this, some of us, maybe? Johnny <laughs> Tremaine, right? Walter Coy plays Dr. Joseph Warren, so a little bit foray back into pop culture in the 20th century. Do we all know this movie? Yes. The town? So now when I ask people, do you know Charlestown, Massachusetts? Oh yeah, that's all the bank robbers over there. <laughs> okay? Sons of Liberty, did anyone see that? Mostly inaccurate, okay? So which is better, you know? Getting him back into the public light or accuracy? I don't know, I, don't know. I guess I'm an accuracy snob, but I guess it's good that he's in the conversation. But here's a huge moment, okay, during President Ronald Reagan's first presidential inaugural address. Who does he quote? On the eve of our struggle for independence, a man who might have been one of the greatest among the founding fathers, Dr. Joseph Warren, President of the Massachusetts Congress, said to his fellow Americans, our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. On you, depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question which, upon which rests the happiness and the liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourself. Right, so this is a huge moment, huge national moment for war, okay? Hamilton, we all know this play, right? Okay, inaccurate, but it's breathing life back into the founders, okay? And I just mentioned the statue of Forest Hill and the efforts of Glenn to, to, to get this there. But, you know, really, it's the Masons who are the keepers and guardians of his legacy, the Massachusetts Freemasons. Several years ago, Glenn, correct me if I'm wrong, they donated half a million dollars from uh, Dick Stewart Grand to Lodge. help the repair the obelisk in Charlestown, okay? They do have papers of Warren's, there's Warren's family Bible, okay, the clock. So again, you know, it really is the Freemasons of Massachusetts that are the guardians of his legacy. And again, I'm not pushing Masonry here, okay? I'm pushing fact. There is no American Revolution without the Masons in during the rebellion, okay? It's just it's just plain and simple. And now I always get the what if questions, right? What if Warren had lived? What if he had survived Bunker Hill? He, he would have been president of the United States, right? You know, I don't like doing speculative history, but I don't think there's any reason to doubt that he would have been as proactive and important in the post-revolutionary era as he was in the pre-revolutionary era. And really think about it, right? That Battle of Bunker Hill, Prescott, Putnam, those are two Connecticut guys. Nobody knows the touring like Warren, okay? So when Washington arrives, what happens when, let me blow your mind here a little. May of 1775, Warren writes a letter to the Continental Congress in Philadelphia and says, you need to unite a national army here because what we have is ragtag militia and you need to appoint a generalissimo. A month later they appoint General George Washington as commander in chief of the Continental Army. So it's not a stretch to say that Warren had a heavy hand in getting the founding of the United States Army. Now unbeknownst to these men on June 17th, they're not fighting under the shield of the provincial militia. They're fighting under the Continental Army because the Army was created on June 14th. So they weren't even aware of this, okay? And really, Warren does it all, right? Voice, pen, and sword. Do we all know Common Sense by Thomas Paine? We've heard of this. This was credited with saving Washington's Army in 1776. Here's what we didn't know. Right on the eve, I think it was December 30th or 31st, all these troop enlistments under Washington are about to expire. The whole army is going to disband. So 
Washington reached out to Connecticut Governor Jonathan Trumbull. They sent him a reverend to read a discharge in front of the army. And Washington writes back to the governor and says, I can't believe what a great job this reverend did. He actually saved the army from disbanding. Who was that reverend? It was Joseph Warren's Harvard classmate. And when he found out how Warren's body was mutilated on the battlefield, he's so upset and disgusted, and his passion fuels them re-enlisting. So again, this would have been over before common sense. So when I say all roads lead through Warren, I'm not kidding. All roads at this point lead through Warren. I mean, he really does it all, right? Voice, pen, sword, and scalpel. And we'll wind down here, okay? Warren writes this a year before his death, and he writes, when liberty is the prize, who would shun the warfare? Who would stoop to waste a coward thought on life? So that'll conclude it, folks. I hope I've convinced you of Warren's importance. And I'm think about it, right? And the question was, is there a theory as to why Warren is not recognized? Why is he as regarded as I, as I think he should be? And I, and I think one of the issues is that, so Warren gets killed in 1775, a year before the Declaration of Independence is penned. So he doesn't die as an American citizen. He dies as a traitorous subject to King George III. So he's not part of this later triumphalist phase in American history, right? Think about all his peers, right? Washington, President, John Adams, President, Samuel Adams, Governor of Massachusetts, John Hancock, Governor of Massachusetts. Do you hear anything really about Paul Revere other than a court martial and a copper mill out in Canton after 1775? No, because I think he loses that conduit to the upper echelon of the Sons of Liberty because Warren, who's his patron, dies, right? And the other founders are looking their nose down at Revere because he's not educated, he didn't go to college, he's a mechanic, he's not part of this upper echelon. So, that in conjunction with that one day overshadows his resistance activities, he doesn't have surviving male heirs, he's reburied four different times, he's not on the freedom trail, he doesn't, I mean, I think to get that term, founder, you either have to have signed, signed the Declaration or the Constitution or both, and if you don't, you're really not going to get that appellation, and I think that's the issue here, is that he dies and exits the stage early on. We don't have a lot of his personal papers. Most of his possessions burn in two 19th century house fires. So it's just all these kind of anchors just dragging it down. But it, 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 it's really a shame. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. All right, folks, come on. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. That was excellent. Thank you. That was fantastic. And uh, it's Robert Vartanian and Stan Gaw, as well as Glenn Cooper, who uh, all have had a uh, hand in that. I think Robert Vartanian said that we should mention, especially because yeah, that's Robert. Robert. Uh, I was wondering if you about the Benedict Arnold that existed back in uh, uh, Ar Benedict Arnold's great grandfather. Have you heard of this character who helped in the original founding of America even prior to the American Revolution? I wanted to just mention while we're bringing up Benedict Arnold in the vortex that you have death field in. There is a lot more behind there, and there's even a forebear of him. And I thought his family is another well image there. I wanted to say thank you. This is oh, no, I, I wanted to ask you about that. I didn't know about that, but I think one of the reasons that Arnold connects with Warren and donates that money is Arnold's wife dies about 10 days after the Battle of Bunker Hill, and Arnold is left a widower. So when he hears the news about Warren, I think he can relate on a yeah. personal level, even though their friendship Prior to that, was on a professional level. Right. So, but but thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Anyone else? We covered it all. Okay. So I've always had a concern that Neil Sosabon really a smart guy. He's grandmaster at the time. He's a doctor. He's a major general. Why does he pick up a rifle? <laughs> you know, I, it, 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 you know, unless we interview him at some point, yeah, I never yeah. know. But I think what happens when I mention at Lexington and Concord, he just, he had, you know, it's almost like this Errol Flynn kind of dashing, charismatic personality where he, you know, think about it, right? Samuel Adams has the tremor, he's older. He becomes the poster boy for the Sons of Liberty. And 
for some reason he just felt compelled. I mean, that, that's why I said every major battle and skirmish in those 60 days, Warren shows up to fight and he's almost killed. And I, and I don't know if that makes him feel invincible and that, you know, because people have accused him of saying, hey, he went to go die. There's a famous quote of his saying, I'd rather die up to my knees in blood, right? And so people assume he went off in a rage to go die at Bunker Hill. Excuse my language here, but it's, it's bullshit, mm -hmm. okay? Because he's writing letters to Dr. Dix, who's hosting his family, saying, could you please purchase me an extra 10 acres of property because I want to pursue more agricultural endeavors over the next year. So he's not, he's not wanting to leave his, his four children widowed, orphaned, all right? Again, he should not have been there, but I guess, you know, we, could, if the, we can fault him for anything, right? It's not making arrangements for his children, and we could fault him for being at that battle. But again, we don't know, he didn't know when he was riding there that there were going to be three assault charges and that Artemis Ward wasn't going to send reinforcements and Putnam wasn't going to send extra ammunition, right? So they are behind this redoubt, so it's hard to know what he was thinking. But, you know, he didn't know. Again, we have that benefit of hindsight, right? So we know that it's going to basically be a bloodbath. But that day, they didn't know what was going to happen, right? There were so many false alarms with Lexington and Concord, where he was getting intelligence information saying, oh, they're going to march tomorrow out to Lexington, they're going to march tomorrow, they're going to march Tuesday. doesn't happen for a couple of weeks until he gets solid information. So again, we don't know if they were going to just make a show of force on Breed's Hill and then maybe go back across the Charles River. We just don't know. So I hope that answered it a little bit. So, yes? Uh, this is a practice related to Dr. Warren, but wasn't Paul Revere's ride stopped before he reached Concord and Lexington? And the other man is the one that actually finished the ride? So the question is, wasn't Revere stopped before he got to Lexington and Concord and didn't another gentleman finish the ride? Well, I was trying to be nice to Revere, okay? <laughs> but the, the bottom line is he doesn't really finish the entire mission, right? He does get caught. He does make it to Lexington, but he does get caught. William Dawes and Sam, uh, Dr. Samuel Prescott, who they meet along the way, actually evade the British troops, but Paul Revere is caught, he's held at gunpoint, he's asked to dismount his horse, they take his horse and he has to walk back. So when he gets back to Lexington, he actually is hearing the shots on Lexington Green. So, yeah. yeah. All right, you, you put down Revere, not me. <laughs> yes. Uh, so what was Joseph Warren's so, you know, again, this is an event that's been shrouded in secrecy. People didn't really talk about it for 50 years after the event. There's a couple of things I didn't even mention, right? There's a song that surfaces a couple of decades later saying, uh, Joseph R. R. Warren's there and bold revere with hands to do and words to cheer. Meet rally boys, there'll be no more taxes. Meet us at the Green Dragon Tavern, bring out your axes. So again, so there's that little song that's connecting in there, okay? Now, if you just think about Masonically, when they're making these plans, these meetings, I mean, there's only about four or five top leaders in Boston at this time, right? Samuel Adams. I mean, there's a famous quote about John Hancock where the British, where the British are saying, he has deep pockets and shallow brains, <laughs> okay? So they're basically saying he's the financier of the rebellion. Adams is the brain trust, right? But, but again, even though these men are at Old South Meeting House, if you just think about it, right? When we know Paul Revere was there. And there's a great book that I'd love to push by David Hackett Fisher called Paul Revere's Ride. I think it was published in 1997. He does a great job in the index. He lists all these organizations and he puts an X next to all the names. Warren is involved in all these organizations, right? The North End Caucus, the Sons of Liberty, the Freemasons. It's just amazing. So, are we supposed to believe that when this meeting at Old South Meeting House ends and everybody's going to Griffin's Wharf, Warren puts his hands in his pocket and says, see you guys, I'm going home. So again, I don't think, and I'm not pushing that he was physically on these ships destroying the tea, but again, that's why I said, let's define the word participation, right? So, you know, let's say, you know, Bob helped put this whole event together, right? But if he wasn't able to make it to the event, did he not have a hand in planning it? So does he get shunned or, and the same thing with Glenn, right? And, and, and Bob Vartanian and Stan Gore, they put that statue of Forest Hills, but, you know, their name's not on the statue, so in a hundred years, is anybody gonna remember them or are they gonna remember the statue or would they go to records at Grand Lodge? So again, the fact that they meet on December 16, 1773 at the Green Dragon Tavern and they're writing, 
that the, the planning of the destruction of the T took up the brethren's time. Again, you know, you have to put all the clues together, and you know, unless we had a video camera there, we're not going to ever know. But but there are primary source letters and documents saying that Warren is having meetings with Richard Clark, who's one of the T consignees, and they're threatening him to show up at Old South Meeting House. So again, when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together, you realize, man, his fingerprints are all over this. He just wasn't on the ship throwing the chest of tea overboard. So I mean, the evidence is pretty overwhelming. Yes, sir. Yes. What role do you think it would have played if he had survived? We assume Washington probably would have given the command because they wanted that in Continental Army with the Southern General and the Northern Army. What would the role have been for Warren in the immediate aftermath of Washington arrival? And then also the next thing on a couple of decades. Right. So, so the question is, you know, what had Warren lived, what role would he have played under Washington's command? And what role would he have played in the decades? following after that? Pretty much. Right? Yeah, so I, again, you know, I don't think that Warren was going to surpass Washington, but I, you know, he, he, I'll give you an example. So when the founding fathers, right, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, um, John Adams, when they vote Washington as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, they write a letter saying, we've appointed a general, he's coming to Cambridge, who do they ask to welcome Washington and read his discharge in front of the troops? Not General Artemis Ward, who's the highest ranking patriot commander at the time. They write it to Warren and ask him to receive Washington and read his command in front of the troops. And John Adams makes a reference saying that when Warren made a harangue, it would make people shudder. Okay? So I guess the short answer would be I definitely think he would have become one of Washington's generals, again, Washington needed help when he shows up, right? This is before Baron, Baron von Steuben and the drill master, you know, instilling discipline in the troops. So again, I think Warren could have at least been a conduit for Washington, showing him the lay of the land. I mean, Washington came up with some wacky ideas during the siege of Boston, right? The Charles River freezes over. He talks about getting ice skates on the soldiers and attacking the British in Boston. I mean. You know, again, some of it's kind of wacky, and I think Warren might have helped temper that because Washington's not Washington at this point, so he will become Washington, but I definitely think that Warren could have been a huge asset to him, not only politically, but militarily. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that Warren would have gone on to be involved in politics, at least in Massachusetts, right? I mean, I don't know if he would have become a senator or a congressman, or, but, but I don't think it's a stretch to say he would have played a pivotal role in the American Revolution as a commander. I don't know if he would have been a general, a major general, definitely one of Washington's general, and I think he definitely would have played an active role after that. So I hope that answers some of the questions. I have a question. Yes. Are you a Freemason? Yes. Where were you made a Freemason? Across the street. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yes. a good, that's a good time. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot the question. No, no, if you remember it, it comes, just for see me after. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's any evidence that you would know of. Uh, the question is, I'm wondering if uh, there's any evidence that you would know of relating Dr. Joseph Warren to the Harrington who was shot, the, one of the first actual martyrs, uh, which is my father's line. So I imagine it's also in other interest in blood. Because this is affecting me very somehow, and I appreciate your work very deeply. I'm wondering if there's any evidence that Harrington and Warren might have, might have, or may have known each other, or if there's anything that you know about Harrington. Not that I can. Right on. Right on. You know, that again, the paper trail is limited, but yeah. I never came across that name in any of. And when you had asked me that, if you yeah. Back, yeah. I actually went through the medical ledgers. Thank you and looked for every name and just couldn't find, and, and you know, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, even though Warren traveled outside yeah. Boston to treat patients, I don't think he would have went that far, or, you know, maybe if he was in the area at the time, but yeah, I can't find any record, any letter, no, nothing. So, you know, the search continues, yes. The parents wasn't full-time, but I found a robot. They brought them to the Dorchester Heights and threatened the British who were in Boston, and that's why they evacuated. Right, because the whole point was to occupy the high ground, right? And now with these cannons, they can start launching volleys at the British warships, at the British themselves. So they thought it was more prudent. Let's let's go south, right? Let's let's get out of Boston and let's go. And and you know it's really a shame because 
once they do move south, Warren's two brothers um, go to Breed's Hill. I mean, he's been in the ground like that for nine months, right? Three feet in a shallow ditch, naked, no possessions. And his two brothers go there, and the body's horribly decomposed. There was a church sexton who had a general idea of where Warren was buried. And when they started digging, the only reason they identified it was because of the silver wire that had been affixed with an artificial tooth. Now, we don't know if it was Paul Revere's handiwork or someone else, but it's the first instance of dentist forensics in the United States. So wow. I, again, it's just, it's just a fascinating story. You know, That's why the fiction stuff drives me nuts, because there's so much intrigue and drama that you, you don't have to make things up. You just, you just tell the facts. Uh, here's a theory, and I want you to comment on it that the Freemasons, when you said it for the architects of the pyramids. That's the Egyptian pyramids? The Egyptian pyramids. Just repeat it, I'm sorry. There's a theory that I have heard that the Freemasons were descended from the, archi descended from the architects who built the pyramids. Right. I mean, I couldn't comment on that. I mean, I've heard all kinds of things about the pyramids from that. There was, you know, uh, aliens that built it. There was another theory saying that there was a civilization before that that had the technology to build it, and then something happened that wiped them out. So, you know, I, I just couldn't comment on that. I, I wouldn't know. So, I, I'm sorry about that. One, one, yeah. one more question. And then oh, sure. We'll wrap it up. Yes. Um, have any of the possessions that were looted from his corpse ever resurfaced? Has any of the possessions that were looted from his corpse? Um, so, no, is the short answer. But th th there's certain, and I won't name them by name, places that say, oh, we have the musket ball that killed him, which is complete nonsense. Um, obviously, the clothes wouldn't have made it through strip. The, the fascinating thing is that the Bible surfaces in London, and someone brings it back to the States, and then it's given to John Warren, his brother. And that was the Bible that he has in his waistcoat. And I mean, you can just imagine Warren praying with the other troops as these British soldiers are mounting that, that hill. So there is a Warren family Bible that's at uh, Grand Lodge. I think the date is 1631. That is definitely one of the Warren Bibles. But again, we do have some other of his material culture pieces, but not from that day. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.